day. Today is the 17th of June, the 14th day of Ukraine's counteroffensive, which began on the 4th of June. And to summarise briefly, it seems to me that the fighting that has been going on continues to follow the pattern that we have seen throughout these 14 days. So that today, for example, we got more reports that Ukraine this time launched a new attack uh, from Orekhov, waited until this morning before it launched it, infantry and infantry fighting vehicles, apparently no tanks this time, but the infantry fighting vehicles are said to be Bradleys, trying to push towards the Russian defences, being hammered again by Russian uh, um, helicopters, um, helicopter gunships, artillery, and uh, Russian uh, infantry troops. And up to this point, up to now, reports suggest that they have made no further progress. They've taken, again, heavy losses, but they've not so far managed to make or to register any significant advances. Now, I should say this is an ongoing battle, and of course it could be that by the time this video appears, things will have changed and the Ukrainians will have made some kind of advance. But up to this time, up to the time of making this program, that hasn't happened. And I have to say, the trend of reporting that I'm getting suggests that it's unlikely to do so. But whether it does or not, <laughs> as I said, we'll just have to wait and see. And similar things happened appear to have happened over the course of yesterday. Now, I'm going to um, go to the Russian Defence Ministry and discuss what they reported happened yesterday. And I'll then turn briefly to what the Ukrainians say. They said that this is the Russian Defence Ministry. During the past 24 hours, Ukrainian units continued to suffer significant losses as they unsuccessfully attempted to conduct an offensive in South Donetsk and Donetsk regions. In the Vremevka salient, the most active combat operations took place in the areas of Rovnopol and Urojainoye, where five attacks by Ukrainian armed forces were repelled as a result of courageous actions by the Rus Russian Vostok group of forces, airstrikes and artillery fire. More than 200 Ukrainian servicemen, five tanks, seven infantry fighting vehicles, five armoured vehicles, four motor vehicles and two motor batteries, mortar batteries have been utilised in the past 24 hours. In Donetsk's direction, the Yug group of forces has successfully repelled five enemy attacks close to Pervomaiskoye, Petrovskoye, Starobikhalovka during the past 24 hours. Up to 215 personnel, Ukrainian personnel, three armoured vehicles, five motor vehicles and two D-20 howitzers were destroyed. Moreover, an ammunition depot of the 109th Territorial Defence Brigade was neutralised close to Nov Novogorodskoye. So this is what the Russian Defence Ministry says, attacks yesterday, various points along the front lines by Ukraine as part of its offensive, all repelled with heavy losses. The Russians claim that Ukraine lost five tanks over the course of the fighting yesterday. Notice that the number of tanks that Ukraine is using, according to the Russians, is now declining. So... No tanks supposedly used in the attack that is ongoing today. Um, an attempt to carry out an attack with tanks yesterday, but apparently only in small numbers, and five tanks apparently destroyed. Putin was, by the way, discussing this battle um, at various points during his um, um, participation in the Spief conference in St. Petersburg yesterday. But it seems as if five tanks were lost. Tank losses, however, seem to be declining 
on the Ukrainian side because Ukraine isn't using its tanks as much as it previously did. But infantry fighting vehicle losses remain high. And we see that in both of the reports about these attacks. And of course, if the Russian Ministry of Defense is to be believed about these losses by Ukrainian troops, well, they claim that Ukraine lost some, some uh, 415 men dead and wounded in these various attacks that took place over the course of yesterday. We still don't have reports from the Russian Defense Ministry about what happened over the um, uh, um, over the course of today. It's too early to get a complete sense of what happened today. Anyway, the Ukrainian Defense Ministry has and tends to be considerably less informative about events than the Russian. But um, the Ukrainian Deputy Defense Minister um, has been talking to the Guardian newspaper in Britain, the Deputy Defense Minister, um, Hanna Maliar. And it tends to be, and this is characteristic of Ukraine, especially when things aren't going particularly well, um, she says practically in all sectors where our units are attacking in the south, they have registered tactical successes. They're gradually moving forward at the moment the advance is up to two kilometers in each direction. And she says, and she, the Guardian goes on to say, Ukrainian forces around the devastated city of Bakhmut, captured by Russia last month, in fact, not confirmed so far, by the way, by Ukraine, but spoken about by, um, by um, um, the Guardian. The Guardian, of course, accepts that Bakhmut has indeed fallen. Anyway, according to Hanna Malia, Ukrainian forces are trying to push Russian forces out from the outskirts of Bakhmut. Now, there's certainly been fighting around Bakhmut, um, not discussed by the Ministry of Defence in any detail. I got the, the Russian Ministry of Defence in any detail. I get the impression that there was less of it yesterday. I might be wrong, but certainly no important place has been captured by the Ukrainians up to now. And notice how vague this account from Hanna Malia is. She says that the Ukrainians have advanced up to two kilometers but it's not clear where yesterday the guardian was saying that the ukrainians are now trying to push towards mariupol um, that they'd advance something like one kilometer towards mariupol i could find no independent evidence that corroborates that claim she also by the way claimed that in the fighting in bakhmut uh, Nine Russian soldiers were killed for every Ukrainian, which again is at odds with everything else that I have seen. Now, I, I will say these are Ukrainian claims. Russian claims are not always accurate either from the Russian Defense Ministry. But I have found that in general, reporting about the state of the conflict from Russian war correspondents, the sort of the people that Putin met with the other day, that tends to be pretty accurate. You get a pretty clear sense of what's happening on the ground. They are some extremely active and capable war correspondents um, discussing the state of the war. Um, and I found that reporting very accurate, and it tends to match that provided by the Russian Ministry of Defense. The Russian Ministry of Defense provides us with sort of the, the overall picture, but for the detail, you have to go to these war correspondents. And I have to say that these war correspondents, I have consistently found throughout the conflict 
that they have been reporting things accurately. They've been reporting Russian advances accurately. They have been reporting Russian retreats and setbacks accurately as well. Often, interestingly, they report on those more quickly than Ukraine itself does. Anyway, they don't say anything that remotely conforms to the picture that Hanna Maliar, the Ukrainian Def Deputy Defence Minister, is giving. I wonder whether Hanna Maliar is just misinformed, or whether she's been given false information, or whether she is saying things that are, she knows are simply not true. I'm not going to try to guess. I'd like to believe that it's the, the first. Anyway, that's, that's where we are. I noticed, by the way, that the British Ministry of Defence, in its latest bulletin, saying absolutely nothing about Ukrainian advances, barely commented about the state of the fighting. Um, it confines itself to telling us that uh, the Russians have gained an advantage in the air and that their helicopter gunships are um, causing Ukraine problems. All of which is, of course, true. And I have also noticed, by the way, that when the British Ministry of Defence gives those kind of reports, it's generally a sign that things are not going well for Ukraine. Anyway, that seems to be the state of things on the battlefronts. Now, I've discussed yesterday, at some length, these rumours about a Ukrainian advance across the Kharkovka uh, reservoir. Um, it was suggested... I mean, I suggested that this might not be as easy a, pro a project as people imagine. I said that the ground would be extremely soft, that there would be no cover. I drew on my experience as a walker to say that walking across a river bed, or indeed a reservoir bed, through a marsh, in other words, is never as easy as people imagine. Uh, there's no cover. If it's done at dark, it's very e in the dark, it's very easy, I suspect, even with night vision dis devices, to become disorientated. I said that I thought that the idea was impractical. And somebody who follows these programs, another member of our invaluable Duran community, shortly afterwards contacted me and said that he is an avid uh, collector of historical maps. He then did some research on what the state of the ground was before the reservoir was created, and he found maps from the 19th century and from the 1940s, and what they all showed was that the area of the Kharkovka reservoir, before it became a reservoir, was actually a marsh. We're talking about marshland. So there is no realistic prospect of this ground drying out. Now, again, I don't know what Ukraine is thinking. Maybe they do think that they can send um, a raiding party of infantry across this swamp, because that's what it would be to reach the nuclear power station in that kind of way. I can't imagine that they could realistically send either tracked or wheeled vehicles, especially armoured vehicles, into this swamp and see them operate effectively in any sort of way. I, I mean, I really can't believe that even they can imagine doing that. As for wheeled vehicles, including Humvees, I, I, I would have thought that this area would be impassable to them. But maybe, maybe they do think that they can send infantry on foot to cross. If so, they will be, as I said, marching straight into fortified Russian positions across a swamp with no cover, either in the day or in the dark. I can't really see that this is going to be a good idea. And given that this area is historic marshland, there is no realistic prospect of it drying out 
at any point in the summer. So I think that if these decisions are being made in a sensible and rational way, I think that this is not a project that Ukraine should try. Now, it could be, and there's a lot of speculation about this, that Ukraine might try uh, an advance across the Dnieper in Kherson region, further south, closer to where the Novaya Kakhovka Dam once was, and it's been suggested that this is a good place to build a pontoon bridge, and something like that could happen. Well, maybe, but I again suspect that this would be a foolhardy project, and I don't think that the fact that the water has gone actually simplifies the operation. On the contrary, I would guess, if anything, again, based on my own experience, it might make it even more complicated. But anyway, that's my view. We'll see what happens and what Ukraine tries to do. Um, the most recent reports suggest that, in fact, what is actually happening is not that Ukraine is assembling forces in Kherson region for some sort of raid across the Dnieper, but on the contrary, it is transferring forces from Kherson region to Zaporozhye region to reinforce the attack that the Ukrainians are trying to make from Zaporozhye region through these big Russian defences, from Orekhov to the Russian-controlled town of Tokmak, and from thence on to Melitopol and the Sea of Azov. And it seems that the major unit that is being transferred is the brigade, which is equipped with the Challenger 2s, the two British Challenger 2s, and the strike of wheeled vehicles. It may be intended to support or take the place of the 47th Brigade of the Ukrainian Army, which is the one equipped with the Bradleys, which has been bearing, taking up much of the fighting and bearing the brunt of many of the losses in the fighting around the Orekhov region up to this point. And anyway, we will see. That would, by the way, mean that the challengers, the, the British challengers, finally are committed to the battle. Mind you, bear in mind there's only about 14 of them. To some say 28, but I think the number is actually 14. Anyway, we will see what they achieve, whether they are any more successful than the Leopard 2s. On the topic of the Leopard 2s, I read in uh, Simplicius the Thinker's latest sutra that apparently the Russians have been examining the Leopard 2s and they're not impressed. They find the armour brittle and the construction poor. They consider that the Leopard 2s are apparently inferior to their own Russian tanks. And there's even some stories that some Ukrainian uh, soldiers have come to the same conclusions, that they think that the Leopard 2s have been overhyped and that they're not anyway good, as good as people said, and that perhaps their old T-64s, in some respects, were better tanks. Now, I think we need to be very careful about these kind of claims. Um, in every war of this kind, you will invariably find that as between superpowers, the superpowers each praise their own equipment and denigrate the other sides. And there's actually a very straightforward reason for this, which is that in terms of equipment, military equipment, tanks, infantry, fighting vehicles, and things like that, well, first of all, you want to maintain the morale of your own side by saying, well, our weapons are much better than their weapons. But there's also, I'm afraid, commercial considerations. You want to tell your friends in the Middle East, don't waste your time buying Leopard 2s. We've examined them. We can tell you our tanks are much better, so buy ours instead. So do bear in mind, a lot of that goes on 
it goes on all the way back to the 1970s and beyond. I remember as a back in the 1970s, I didn't take a huge amount of interest in this sort of thing, but I do remember that British and American and Israeli spokesmen in those days routinely denigrated Soviet equipment of that period, making out that Western equipment was immeasurably superior. And of course, I accepted that. I had no reason to doubt that this was true, except, of course, that it turns out that it wasn't. If you want to get a real understanding, an objective understanding of Soviet and Russian weapons, I would again suggest go to the books by Jim Kinnear. He has actually had the opportunity to look at these goods with uh, these these machines with a cold, objective eye. He's an engineer, and he has an understanding of these machines, and as I said, has had access to them. And, well, he knows what he's talking about. And you'll get a much better sense of what Russian equipment and Soviet equipment is like and was all about. And I'm afraid when it comes to Leopard 2s and Challenger 2s, no doubt there are Jim Kinnear-type figures in Russia doing the sort of work that he is doing about Soviet and Russian equipment in the West, but I don't know them. But anyway, for what it's worth, it's clear that the Leopard 2 was not a wonder weapon, the um, Bradley was not a wonder weapon, I am pretty sure that the Striker won't be either. Um, Scott Ritter, in the programme we did with him, the live stream we did with him earlier this week on Tuesday, discussed its many problems and the many problems of operating uh, strikers successfully. Anyway, and the fact that the US is finding itself required to send another 10 suggests to me that the Ukrainians are already having problems with the strikers and need replacements. And as for the Challenger 2s, well, I am fairly sure that what we will find when they do eventually go into battle is that they may indeed be formidable tanks, but they're not wonder weapons either, and the Russians can deal with them. Whilst on the subject of wonder weapons, there's been a lot more discussion about what's going to happen with the F-16s, and the consensus that appears to be forming is that the F-16s, when they are eventually delivered, will not be the top of the range, absolutely most advanced F-16s. They will be older generation F-16s, some of them at the very end of their useful life, some of them actually about to be put into retirement, in other words, dispensed with by the air forces which operate them, principally Denmark, Bel Belgium and the Netherlands. And the general view is that because these are old aircraft, they're going to be extremely maintenance intensive. And of course, for the reasons many people have already discussed about the F-16s, it is a maintenance intensive aircraft anyway, at least by comparison with the MiG-29s and Suhoi-27s that Ukraine has been using. Now, I'm going to discuss some of the things that Putin said at Spief in a moment, but far and away, his most important comments over the course of the discussions at Spief on the question of the conflict was the one about F-16s. He said that if the F-16s operate from Ukraine, well, the Russians will deal with them. But if they are actually flying into the combat zone from bases in NATO countries, well, he made it absolutely clear that the Russians are considering whether or not to launch counter-strikes against those F-16s at their bases. He didn't say exactly that that was what the Russians 
had decided to do, but he came very close to hinting that that is precisely what might happen. And he said that delivering to Ukraine and operating F-16s in that way, they won't change the outcome of the war. Ukraine will still lose, Russia will still win, but it will expand it. It will internationalize it. It will mean that more and more NATO countries are getting drawn into it. Now, I think this is a very serious warning indeed. I think it should be taken extremely seriously, whether the Western powers have the understanding of how serious it is, I'm not sure. It could be, coming back to some of the things I discussed yesterday, that Western leaders will consider this all a bluff and will decide to do this anyway and will assume that the Russians will not respond. If so, I think that may be an unwise and very dangerous assumption. Now, let's perhaps recap. So far, an offensive that appears deadlocked. It's not even reached the Ukraine, the Russian front lines. At Spief, by the way, Putin said that in some places Ukraine hadn't reached the front lines, in other places it had, but um, overall it's failed to make any progress. For the record, I do not know of a single place where Ukraine has actually managed to reach Russia's big fortified lines. It could be when Putin was talking about the Ukrainians reaching Russian fortified lines, he had a different concept in mind, but of what fortified lines might be. But whatever it was, I don't know of a single case when the Ukrainians have actually broken through this, the zone of control that the Russians have uh, in front of their fortified lines and actually reached those fortified lines. And there's been an interesting and useful piece about all of this um, from the uh, moon of Alabama. And he's pointed out that the United States should have been aware in advance of the way in which the Soviets, first the Soviets and now the Russians, prepare their defences. And he quotes from the US Field Manual 100-2-1, which described Soviet arm, the Soviet army in defence. And the quotation is, Where, when the defence is established before contact with the enemy, the Soviets establish a security echelon up to 15 kilometers forward of the main defensive area, which is exactly what we're seeing. All of this fighting that we've been talking about is happening roughly 10 to 15 kilometers ahead of the main fortified area. The elements which make up the security echelon come from the division's second echelon, a security force of up to one battalion size may be deployed in front of each first echelon regiment. So these are not the best troops. They're from the second line of troops. They're put, a, put, in, put in the forward. The best troops are held back to, and, and are more numerous, are, are held back to defend the fortified line. And then it goes on to say, a detailed and coordinated fire plan is developed. Weapons are positioned so that the maximum amount of fire can be brought to bear directly in front of the forward edge of the battle area. Enemy penetrations are blunted by shifting artillery fire and by counter conducting counterattacks. And of course to that we must add the helicopter gunships. So this is exactly <laughs> this, this, this manual describes exactly what the Russians are doing. It's Soviet doctrine, well-established Soviet do doctrine, when setting up defence lines. You station um, 
one battalion from every regiment taken taken from your second echelon, your in other words less perhaps high grade troops. You station it forward. You use it to blunt the enemy's advance, and you also develop a very intricate fire plan so that every part of this security area is covered by your artillery so that you can hit the advancing enemy and deplete their forces before they break through. And as I said, this is, this is the way in which the Russians are defending. There is nothing fundamentally new here. And Bernhardt at the Moon of Alabama also, by contrast, quotes, gives a quote from General Petraeus, U.S. military um, officer, fairly well known at one time. He was, for a time, CIA director as well. He's an enthusiastic supporter of Ukraine. And this quote, by the way, of Petraeus has been widely, uh, um, widely circulated over the last 24 hours uh, on the internet. I believe that it was first spotted by somebody called Sai Cherubashka. I, I'm not quite sure who that person is, but it was on Twitter. But anyway, this is what General Petraeus said and how he predicted that the Ukrainian offensive, which for some reason he still calls a counteroffensive, would go. And he apparently said this on BBC Radio Force Today program. And this was his words. I think that this counteroffensive is going to be very impressive. My sense is that they will achieve combined arms effects. In other words, they will successfully carry out combined arms operations where you have engineers that are breaching the obstacles and diffusing the minefields and so forth, armor following right on through, protected by infantry against anti tank missiles air defence keeping the Russian aircraft off them, electronic warfare jamming their radio networks, logistics right up behind them, artillery and mortars right out in front of them. And most important of all is that as the lead elements inevitably culminate after 72 to 96 hours, notice that time frame, physically that's about as far as you can go, and they'll have taken losses. You have follow-on units that will push right on through and capitalise on the progress and maintain the momentum. And I think that that can get the entire Russian defence in the area moving. Then I think you have other opportunities that will open up on the flanks as well. And again, that, to my mind, describes precisely what the Ukrainians tried to do. They, they followed the plan that was laid for them. You saw these mine layer vehicles with their engineers, mine clearing vehicles with their engineers, trying to clear the minefields. You saw the um, armoured vehicles with the infantry and the tanks following close behind. No doubt such electronic warfare systems as Ukraine has were also operating. There isn't much sign of much um, air defence, however, but anyway, that is what they did try to do. But perhaps they didn't do it very well. Perhaps General Petraeus underestimated the difficulties. But it hasn't worked. And notice that he thought that the timeline for the breakthrough, the punch through the defence lines, was 72 to 96 hours of most a five-day period, and here we are, it's the 14th day, and nothing like that has happened. So, so far, as I said, this has been both sides trying to do things by the book. The Russians are doing it successfully. The Ukrainians are not. I have to say, given the scale of the Russian fortifications, given the size of the Russian forces, I, for one, am completely not surprised that up to this point, at least, things have turned out as they have done. Now, there's been much commentary about this. M.S. Badrakuma, the um, Indian diplomat, has uh, written 
on this very topic. He's always someone who takes a great interest in these conflicts, and he, even though he's, I suspect, not <coughs> of a, he has no more of a military background than I have, um, he says that um, he, he makes he makes the following point. He says that given the stark realities, Kiev should roll back the offensive, but that is not going to happen. Kiev is under immense pressure from Washington to claim some dramatic success. The Ukrainian defences, however, are not infinite. Around 35,000 to 40,000 strong Ukrainian reserves are facing a massive deployment manifold stronger in numbers, in hundreds of thousands, these are Russian forces, and advanced weaponry and enjoying air superiority. And uh, Badrakuba speculates that at some point the Russians will go on the offensive themselves. Now, that's, it seems to me, where we are on the battlefronts. There's been, again, more Russian missile and drone attacks across Ukraine. I would say that many of these drone attacks with these Geranium-2 drones are relatively cheap. The Geranium-2 drones, which apparently the Russians have modified and adapted, and which are now in production in Russia. There's apparently been a factory that has been created in Russia, which is just churning them out. Well, these are relatively simple machines. They don't cost very much, even with the adaptations that they have. And in consequence, they're proving that the Russians, the Russians are showing that they can churn them out in essentially infinite quantities. And the Ukrainians have a dilemma. Do they use their limited, they're now increasingly diminishing air defences to try to shoot down these things? Or do they husband their air defences? In which case, of course, the Geranium-2 drones just get through and destroy whatever it is that the Russians are, want them to destroy. And this is a problem for Ukraine. And, of course, it isn't just the Geranium-2 drones, but we know that Russian cruise missiles are now operating as well. The Russian Air Force has been launching its KH-101 subsonic cruise missiles um, on a regular basis from its strategic bombers against Ukraine and the Russian Black Sea Fleet has been launching increasing numbers of Calibre missiles at Ukraine as well and every so often the Russian Air Force also carries out a Kinjal strike with hypersonic Kinjal missiles. Well the Russians on this are about to add another weapon to their arsenal because they've apparently now forward deployed um, BAL um, anti-ship subsonic cruise missiles um, in Bryansk region um, on the border where they are well within range of striking Kiev. And these are relatively small missiles, cruise missiles. They have a range of about 250 kilometers, but as I said, it seems Kiev is about 200 kilometers distance, so it's within range. Anyway, these missiles fly very close to the surface, to the, to, to the ground. They're very difficult to defect, detect. They're quite small. They have a relatively small warhead, but they do have you know, a substantial warhead nonetheless, small only in relation to that of the other bigger Russian cruise missiles. And it is likely that they will be joining the attack. Presumably these missiles have now been adapted for, ground, for, for land attack roles as well. And, by the way, and for the record, I believe that these are also relatively cheap missiles to make. Certainly cheaper than, say, the much larger um, KH-101s, which are launched by the Russian uh, bombers, the strategic bombers. 
So a new line of attack against potential targets in Kiev as well. And again, what do the Ukrainians do? Do they use their depleting air defense missiles in and around Kiev to try and shoot these things down, difficult as that might be? Or depleting their reserve of air defense missiles still further? Or do they just accept that some of these missiles are going to get through? Well, Ukraine continues to insist that there was a big Russian missile strike on Kiev the other day when the African delegation was in Kiev meeting President Zelensky. And they are making all sorts of extraordinary claims. They claim to have shot down another six Kinjal missiles. The Russians are saying nothing about this. They're not reporting any kind of strike on Kiev at all. And of course, as I discussed in my program yesterday, a representative of the South African president, one of the people who was attending this meeting in Kiev, who was actually physically there, so that there were no explosions, no sign of a missile attack whilst he was there. And he made it pretty clear that he didn't think that any sort of missile attack of any kind had actually happened. Now, yesterday, I said in my program that I thought perhaps the Russians had launched some kind of a missile attack, perhaps on the Zhuleni um, airfield to destroy Ukrainian air defense systems. But it seems that that did not happen, because I would have expected that if it did, the Russian Defense Ministry would at least have said something about it. So I swung round to the view that this South African official was right and that there was no actual attack on Kiev at all. That this attack on Kiev, missile attack on Kiev, which continues to be reported as such in the Western media, is a figment of Ukraine's imagination. It's a rather difficult thing for me to believe. I find it struggle to imagine that a government would simply conjure up an illusion of a missile attack on itself. But for the moment, that seems to be the most likely explanation of what happened. I'm going to leave it open if there's anybody who can provide me with evidence that there was such a missile attack, an actual, you know, information about such missile attacks, air raid warnings, something of that kind, well, something a bit more than that, sounds of explosions and that kind of thing, then I would be very interested and I will revise my views. But for the moment, the consensus seems to be that there was no missile attack and that the Ukrainians invented it, perhaps in order to impress the African leaders. In which case, by the way, I think that that attempt will have failed. On that topic, the African leaders are indeed on their way to Moscow, or rather to St. Petersburg, as I said. Uh, apparently, President Zelensky tried to dissuade them from going to Russia, and that won't have gone down very well. He apparently told them, well, what's the point of you going to Russia? But they are apparently going to Russia, and the indications are that they will be meeting Putin in St. Petersburg today, when they will be presenting him with, his, with their ideas. But anyway, just to say that that African peace mission continues. Now, these missile attacks on Kiev, the real ones, uh, have, um, of course, raised certain questions. There was that attack that Kinjal missile attack on the Patriot system some weeks ago. The Americans only admit that there was damage done to the Ukrainian system. The Russians claim that they knocked out five launchers, five Patriot launchers, <coughs> and destroyed a um, radar, the radar system of the Patriot. 
the Ukrainians say that they shot down six Kinjal missiles, though they've never provided anything remotely like evidence to support that claim, convincing evidence to support that claim, which, however, much of the Western media has simply accepted. Well, I noticed that during the question and answer at the Spief summit, Putin again reiterated that the Russians have destroyed five Patriot missile launchers. So I, I would have thought that the Russians feel themselves fairly confident about what they did destroy over the course of that missile strike. But perhaps more interesting than that is a report that Germany has now agreed to supply Ukraine with a further 62 Patriot missiles. It's important to say that I think that more than one battery of missiles was supplied, at least two, perhaps three. The first attack might have done severe damage to one Patriot missile battery, but there are probably others there still operating. The Russians have launched more attacks on them, and perhaps more damage has been done, but it's clear that there are still Patriots defending Kiev, whatever the Russians think or did destroy. But anyway, Germany has agreed to supply 62 more missiles. That already points to the speed through which Ukraine is running through its air defence missiles. It's doing so at a pace which is already starting to deplete Western arsenals of air defence missiles, and the Patriot system has always been in heavy demand and is a centrepiece of American air defences in the Pacific. So this is causing problems. And it seems that the United States, it's in its latest commitment of weapon systems to Ukraine, it can only, it's intending to send the much older Hawk anti-aircraft missile system, which has its origins in the 1950s, obviously extensively refurbished to Ukraine, but this is no, no longer a case of the United States being able to supply more patriots. So we see that Ukraine is probably now struggling even to mount an effective defense of Kiev. And Putin, in fact, commented on this. He said, why should we, you know, we, 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 he said, we are in a position to destroy any building we want to in Kiev now. He made it clear that it was political reasons that are deterring the Russians from doing this. He said that the Ukrainians are continuously trying to goad Russia, and their Western backers are continuously trying to goad Russia into doing something which will enable the Ukrainians and the West to complain, to, to criticise the Russians for being cruel and brutal. And he said that the Russians will not be provoked or distracted from their ongoing task to win the conflict in Ukraine by allowing themselves to be provoked in that kind of way. So that was what Putin had to say about that. But we have had attacks that the Russians claim to have launched on two decision-making centres in Ukraine. And one of them, interestingly, as well known, was the headquarters of Ukraine's military intelligence agency, the institution headed by Kirill Budanov. Now, Budanov has been out of sight for several weeks now. There's been no sign of him. And again, the question is, what's happened to Budanov? And there's been lots of rumours that he was caught, he was af affected by that particular strike on the building of the military intelligence agency 
in Kiev, which the Russians carried out. Now, a spokesman for Ukrainian military intelligence has just said that Budanov is alive and well, and healthy, and he's hard at work. And of course, he may be. But Stern magazine, which is German, has sort of confirmed, I stress sort of confirmed, that he was in fact injured and that he was quickly flown from Ukraine to Germany and is in a coma in a German hospital. Now, I'm not in any kind of position to confirm this story and I don't know what the quality of Stern's sources are. What I would say is this, this is apparent confirmation from a German publication. So perhaps this is true. But anyway, we'll just have to see. But it is curious that we haven't seen much of Budanov, in fact anything of Budanov for some time now, and one does wonder why. If the Russians have indeed struck at him. And notice that Putin, in his discussions with the military correspondents the other day, said that the Russians have done things that they don't want to publicize. But if the Russians have done this and have actually struck at such a senior official within the Ukrainian military and political leadership. I think this will have come as something of a shock in Kiev amongst the political leaders there and it might explain why over the last couple of days, some time now, we've seen an apparent decline in Ukrainian attacks deeper into Russia against Moscow and cross-border raids into Belgorod region and such things. By the way, on that topic, I should say that Chechen forces have now been deployed to Belgorod region and have taken some role in defending it from further Ukrainian incursions. And I also should say that I take Putin's words that the Russians have the ability to destroy any individual building in Kiev that they wish as an implicit threat. He's saying, look, we're not going to fall for Ukrainian provocations. We're not going to start attacking civilian buildings in the way that they have done. But addressing the leadership of Ukraine now, we know where you are. If we have to, if you push us too far, we have the ability to come for you. You can run, but you can't hide. I, that, that was how I read Putin. I read Putin's words. Now, of course, that might be wrong. It may be that there are other interpretations. But I thought, as I said, to me, it came across as something of a threat. Anyway, we will see. Now, <laughs> uh, and we will see whether Mr. Budanov ever reappears. And of course, if he's healthy and well, as uh, Ukrainian officials say, well, no doubt he will, no doubt he will, he will re-emerge. And um, in the meantime, as I said, he does remain absent, and that is strange, and we've now had this report from Stern. On the topic of the other person who has mysteriously <coughs> disappeared, it's point been pointed out that General Zaluzhny, the Ukrainian uh, overall commander, who has also been notably quiet recently. Um, he was the subject of a very laudatory um, piece by him, by the BBC. And at the end of it, they say that they tried to contact him for an interview, but that he declined. Now, he's never been shy of giving interviews up to now. So one does wonder what is going on with him. Perhaps, if you still want to believe it, he's busy with the counteroffensive. Perhaps there are other reasons 
which prevent him from engaging. But anyway, that's where we are. Now, a lot, of course, has been going on on the battlefronts. Ukraine continues to be a vitally important, in fact, the pivotally important conflict. But for Putin, at least, economic matters remain a pressing priority. And his long address at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum were principally about this. And he gave a very optimistic um, overview of the state of the Russian economy. And he said that it had withstood the sanctions attack, that it is now growing, and he repeated the numbers that it looks like it could grow at up to 2% this year. He said that in April, GDP growth was 3.3%. He didn't say whether that was by comparison with last year or 3.3% over the previous period. But anyway, it does look as if he thinks that there's growth returning to the economy. He spoke about how agriculture is doing well. He spoke about how industry is now recovering and is expanding. He's talked about how services have stabilised and are expanding as well. And he spoke at very considerable length about how um, the reason Russia has been able to achieve all of this is because of the long years that have been spent by the Russian government and by the central bank working to create macroeconomic stability in the country, giving people the sense that tomorrow will be like today, that you're not going to get a cataclysm if the ruble you know, depreciates by a dollar, that they're not living on the side of a volcano, that people now are able to plan ahead, to build up their businesses, to plan their lives, to take on credit, if that's what they need to do, without fearing that catastrophe is round the corner and that they shouldn't therefore be doing any of these things. And he says that this stability, this macroeconomic stability, has also given the government a great deal of space to do things which it was not able to do up to now. And... He gave what I thought was a fairly dynamic overview of the future for the Russian economy. He spoke about supply-side reforms. And what he meant by that, basically, was lots of steps to eliminate red tape, to make it easier for business people to set up businesses, to operate those businesses, to be free to pointless and needless bureaucratic regulations. He talked about very, very considerable changes to the tax system, the attempts to modify the tax system so that people would not be penalised if they went into full-time work by losing social benefits after being, in the case of a woman, on a period of maternity leave, for example, or um, in the case of a, uh, of a man who's been unemployed <laughs> finding you know, that they could lose um, income if they went into full-time work because the social supports would disappear. Or in the case of a business person, if they'd increase the size of their business to from, from a small to a medium-sized business, nervous about taking the next step to make it into a larger business because tax breaks would be would drop away. Well, Putin made it clear that that was a priority, sorting out all of those problems to encourage people to join the labour market, to participate in economic activity, to set up their own businesses, to develop those businesses. He spoke about how businesses are indeed growing. Numbers of businesses are growing in Russia. Numbers of self-employed people are growing, are, are increasing in Russia. But he spoke also about things like um, heavy investments in infrastructure, building roads, uh, building um, air routes, all of that sort of thing, airports. 
he spoke about a major construction program to build up again the Russian merchant fleet. He said that he suggested that the Russian economy is now at the start of a virtuous cycle, that more investment, there's been heavy investment in the Russian economy, that more investment is producing more um, economic activity, that is translating into higher tax, higher tax income for the government, even as taxes remain steady. And he also said that the proportion of revenue that Russia receives from oil and gas is now declining. And he spoke about how non-oil and gas revenue from the rest of the economy is now increasing very fast. And he spoke about developing supply chains, internal supply chains. He said that Russia would maintain an open economy, that it would not retreat into autarky, that it would not revert to a kind of control, command and control system like the Soviet Union once was, but that it would trade openly with the rest of the world, seeking, of course, always to do business with those countries that were prepared to do business with it, with Russia, on an equal basis. And there was an awful lot of talk of that kind, always with Putin, with facts and figures and examples, illustrations, all of these things set out in fantastic detail. Now, the overall impression I got is that the Russian economy is now effectively at that point of maturity, that this very difficult and very complex period of transition from the Soviet economic model, which began in the 1980s, the late 1980s, and which went through every conceivable period of upset, mistake, wrong turns, you name it, that as largely as a result of the hard work that Putin and his team have put in, that this transition has now finally been completed and that the economy has now achieved that point of maturity and stability where it is able to grow without growth immediately translating into inflationary surges or anything of that kind or massive imports flooding into the country. And you can see this in the way that the financial system is able to operate effectively without having to pull in capital from the West, without having to borrow from the West, so that it's able to lend to the government, for example, without um, apparently encountering any strain. It's able to provide credit to the population without providing strain either. The tax system is working stably and normally. And in effect, Russia now has a stable economy. Something you couldn't say about it for most of the post-Soviet transition period. And the economy that has evolved and which has achieved this stability is an economy which actually has, in my opinion, a very Asian look about it. It is not really like the economies of the, not like the US economy or like the economies of Western Europe, in the sense that you find that the state still controls much of what used to be called the commanding heights. The banking system is largely, though not entirely, state controlled. The big banks, Sparebank, Gazprom Bank, VTB are state owned. And that gives the government enormous leverage over the economy if it wishes to use it. The government also is able to uh, control a lot of manufacturing, heavy manufacturing industry, the machine tool industry, the military industrial complex, uh, large parts of the um, irons and steel industry. It's even involved now increasingly in the pr production of motor vehicles, though not entirely so. And 
it also is able to supervise and regulate a lot of what these industries do, even industries that are nominally private, privately run, they, the, the, the bigger ones, operate in very, very close contact with the central economic managers and administrators in Moscow. And alongside this structure with the, the um, government also playing, of course, continue to play a dominant role in oil and gas with Rosneft and Gazprom um, operating, the government controlling infrastructure, railways, uh, building the roads, uh, developing the airports, doing all of those sort of things. Alongside that, there is an enormous, or at least a growing, and perhaps soon to become, enormous and thriving private sector, which Putin basically says should be kept left completely alone to do what it wants. There is labour regulation in Russia, as there is practically everywhere else, and Putin went out of his way to commend the fact that um, unemployment in Russia is now very low, at historically low levels, but in, every, in almost every respect, as I said, private business people who want to set up their own businesses, who want to run their own businesses, are left alone to do it. And he talked a great deal about reducing the regulatory burden on these small business people, including, I got the impression, in terms of labour, uh, the commitments they have to make to some of their workers, to their workers. And this is very like what you will find in China, what you used to find, or what you to a certain extent still find in other places like um, Singapore, um, South Korea, indeed even Japan. Um, a much more controlled structure in terms of the big industries, even as I said, when they are nominally privately owned. In many cases, of course, in China especially, they still continue to be state-owned. And at the same time, all of this happening alongside a thriving private industry and private agriculture, where again, the state, however, plays a huge role and where the, where the state is able to a great extent to influence investment decisions and where there are, again, small farmers able to do whatever they choose, operating alongside these big agricultural conglomerates based on the old Soviet collective and state farms, which operate now essentially as private companies. Anyway, it's a, as I said, more of an Asiatic, an Asian model, if you like, than a Russian one, than a, sorry, than a Western one. Except, of course, and I wonder how, whether we're even justified in calling it as an Asian model, because those who are students of Soviet history will know that this was not entirely unlike the structure that uh, existed in the Soviet Union for a certain period of time in the 1920s. In the 1920s, again, the state made sure that it controlled what it called the commanding heights of the economy, heavy industry, transport, that kind of thing. In fact, I believe it was at that time that the expression commanding heights was first um, invented. But again, in that period, known as NEP, the New Economic Policy, um, private business was not only tolerated, it was actually for a time encouraged, and the government, even at that time, attempted to pursue an open relationships with other countries, and the ruble, for a certain time, was even pegged to gold. 
So you could say that, you know, what goes round comes round, and in effect, Russia is going through another period, reverting to that model of the 1920s. It tried centrally controlled, carefully targeted, uh, incredibly structured planning systems uh, in the 1930s and for most of the Soviet era. And then in the 90s, it went for unconstrained, free market, practically unregulated capitalism taking Western American ideas to their most extreme levels. And now the pendulum has swung back and perhaps we found ourselves again in a model not unlike that which they had in the 1920s, but perhaps the one which is most suited to their current conditions, their, their present level of economic development. And that may explain, in fact, I suspect it probably does explain, why we see the economy now so stable and why, after long years of prioritising inflation reduction, this really began in 2011, when the government and the central bank actually formally announced that they were going to work to try to bring inflation down to, well, the 4% target was developed at around that time. Um, up to that point, up to 2011, Russia had experienced double-digit inflation in practically every year, I think in every but one year since the Soviet Union's collapse. Anyway, long, long years since then, a prioritizing inflation reduction and price stability over growth, there's a sense that price stability has now effectively been achieved. Macroeconomic stability has been achieved. Growth has returned. The financial system is stable. And now they can start to be more ambitious and go ahead with a more dynamic economic policy, prioritising economic growth. Anyway, that seems to be what Putin thinks. I have to say, he came across extremely self-confident at this uh, meeting at Spief and um, on economics. Uh, and I also got the sense, by the way, that both over the course of his various interactions at Spief and in his meetings with the war correspondents, he was pretty confident about the military situation in Ukraine as well. And by the way, and in addition, he made it fairly clear to me, that at least, that whatever eventual settlement is achieved at the conclusion of this war, in Ukraine. It'll be one that is based on <laughs> Russian ideas. Lavrov has, by the way, reiterated that today, that Ukraine has to accept all four of the, all of the various uh, concepts that the Russians set out right at the start of the special military operation and accept the loss of the four regions at a minimum. And that, of course, and of course, Putin himself said, actually said, that the longer Ukraine and the West take to accept that, the harsher the terms will be. Anyway, that's where I finish today. Um, just to say again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble, Bitshoot, Odyssey, Rockfin and Telegram. You can also um, go to our shop get the amazing things that you will find there, our new range of magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, um, and all the rest. He also, uh, you can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. And last but not least, if you've liked this program, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you again, more from me soon, and have a very good day.